We've talked of emotional intelligence and how Goleman and his co-workers such as Boyatis developed and, if you like, codified this. The four elements of self-awareness and self-management, awareness of others and the management of relationships and what lies behind that. Goleman and his co-workers also looked at leadership in terms of emotional intelligence. In a really good book called The New Leaders, they, through their research, identify six emotionally intelligent styles of leadership. And they look at these from the most positive, by which they mean the most liberating, energizing, motivating, creative, engaging, down to the least positive, or if you like, the most dangerous leadership styles that are clearly important in some instances, but if overused, can be very demotivating very disengaging and really stifle creativity. We're just going to look at those very quickly now. The first and most positive style of leadership they identified was visionary. We cover visionary leadership in depth elsewhere in this program. The key point here, though, of course, that it's okay to be a visionary, to see that which does not yet exist, to see that wonderful future of how things could be if they were so much better. But there's a difference between seeing that and being able to lead people towards it. And that, of course, is the ability to connect the people with the vision through proper communication and through enabling them to see what's in it for them to help you move towards that vision. We call that, as you'll remember, perhaps, enlightened self-interest. And that's the essence of visionary leadership. And also, of course, when people understand it for themselves, it becomes there. So the visionary leader has to let go of the personal nature of the vision and really enable others to achieve that with them and for them. So that's very, very positive, because once people have that vision, they will go there with you, and they will help and support you. The next uh, most positive sort of leadership they saw was coaching. The coaching style of leadership. Now, the important thing about coaching is it's not telling people what to do. There's a difference between teaching, do it like this and do it like that, Training, much the same, but in a different environment, very specific. Mentoring, which is where someone of greater experience partners with someone of less experience. And when the person with less experience has an issue, they could say, help me out with this. And mentors give advice, usually based on their greater experience. And coaching, because coaching is all about, not the coach, but about the person being coached, about what's called the coachee. So the coaching leader doesn't say, do it like this, this is how I want it done. The coaching leader's response is, how would you do this? What is the best way that you can see? And when somebody comes to the coaching leader with a problem, probably a problem they've been nurturing for months, oh, what a big, beautiful problem I have. Instead of the, coach, the leader going, Oh yes, well, well, give it to me and I'll help you with it. The coaching leader goes, what an interesting problem you have. How would you like to deal with it? What are the best ways you can see with dealing with it? What would happen if you did this way or that way? And they enable that other person to understand for them what is the best way forward. So the key thing about coaching leadership is that it is the most enabling of other people and therefore really generates energy and motivation. The next style of leadership was affiliative. Affiliative, what does that mean? Well, you probably in your company have uh, affiliate, uh, affiliates, companies or organisations that are affiliated to the main organisation but aren't really an essential part of that main organisation. You are probably affiliated with groups, sporting groups, political groups, social groups, community groups. You are affiliated and you affiliate yourself with them. So that means to be connected, 
to be associated with. And the affiliative leader is expert at creating that sense of unity, of creating that sense of team, of common purpose, of common identity. I always think at this point of Shakespeare's Henry V, when he's trying to motivate his team of soldiers, grossly outnumbered by the enemy, sick and tired, to fight and to win. And he uses a lot of affiliative leadership there, talking about we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, and creating this sense of special identity of those here. And if you've heard of that phrase, band of brothers, probably through the TV programme, that's where it comes from. And it is a fantastic example of that affiliative leadership. And if you've been a member of a sports team, somebody's giving you a real rousing talk before you go out and play in your final or your semi-final or whatever, they will use affiliative leadership. We're special. We're good. We are this. We are that. A little bit of difference, differentiation from the opposition. So again, very positive in releasing energy. And then next comes the democratic. democratic style of leadership. We all know what this is. Oh, well, what shall we do? I tell you what, we'll go with the majority. Who's for it and who's against it? And we'll go with the winners. Now this can be positive because it indicates and allows everybody to be involved. But think for just a minute about what the dangers of this might be for a leader. If they were to overuse a democratic style, what will people think about them? Maybe you've got someone or you've worked for someone that does this. What does it make you feel about them? Yes, you're right. If it's used too much, it gives the impression that they don't really have a vision for themselves. They don't really care. At worst case, they don't actually know what they're doing. They keep asking everybody else, what do you want to do? What would you think is best? And we'll go with what you think. But when it's used perfectly, it can be incredibly empowering and liberating. The example I always think of when I was in business was that we would be deciding about the Christmas party for all the employees. And it was very strange for me because there always used to be a bit of a discussion of do we take our partners to the Christmas party or not? And it would always be, well, why not? And some people wouldn't. And then I understood. But the key question here is how do we resolve that? Well, it's not a strategically important issue, but it's very important to everybody. So at that case, we would just put it back to everybody and say, what do you wish to do? Bring partners or not bring partners? And we will go with the majority decision. Now, in all the diagrams, you then see a dotted line here because we're moving from predominantly positive leadership styles to potentially negative leadership styles. And the first one of these is pace setting. Now, as you will know, the pace setter is somebody in a race who sets the pace. There may be several pace setters running ahead of the real runners just to keep the pace up like that, to help them go faster. Now, this is very important in a couple of real key instances. When you're starting a project or indeed building up a new company, pace setting, setting the example, keeping the pace going, keeping the energy up is very important. And entrepreneurs are the classic pace setting leaders. The difficulty here is that the true pace setter is so involved with running forward that they forget to look behind. And when they do look behind, everybody else goes, oh, I can't keep up. Oh, this is so exhausting. I can't keep up. So if it's done too much, it causes burnout. I don't know if you've ever had that case where it's probably six or seven o'clock, you've had a boss who is always in the office working hard, and it's seven o'clock and you just try and creep out without being seen. And then you hear over the top, ah, leaving early, are you, Can Well, look at this, never mind, come in early tomorrow. You're not getting your work done. You go, well, actually, you know, it's, it's 7.30. I'd rather like to get home and see the kids for once this week. What? See the family? Why do you bother? I've had three families already. I'm on my fourth marriage. What's that got to do with anything? So the extreme pace setting leader forgets to connect with the people that are being led and causes burnout. But used at the right time, at new projects, new companies, new initiatives, it's crucial. 
And then finally, was commanding. Do this, do that. Sit down, shut up, do as you're told. Recognise this? Reminds me of my school days to a large extent. Commanding is an extremely necessary and valuable leadership style in very specific situations. If there is a fire in this building now, I want someone to come in and say, right, there's a fire, you, down those stairs and out the building now. And I would go, thank you, I'm out of here. But imagine if that's overused. And maybe you, as many of us, have been subject to the slings and arrows of outrageous commanding leadership styles from different people. What happens? It becomes incredibly debilitating, doesn't it? If somebody's constantly telling, commanding, not listening, not evolving, not engaging, not motivating, not hearing you, not seeing you, it does, of course, completely destroy motivation, engagement, energy, and everything else. We will become automatons. So although it is inc incredibly valuable when it's needed, it is needed in very specific situations, usually when there is an emergency. Again, from my personal review, I was in a company and there was a lot of trouble in it. We had a new CEO come in who very quickly told everybody what was going to happen and did it because it was a survival situation and quick, direct, unquestioned action was necessary. After that, of course, it was relaxed and people could begin to create and engage again. So look at these styles. Visionary coaching, affiliative, democratic, pace setting and commanding. Write them down on a piece of paper just like this. And then I would like you to do two things. I would like you to draw a column and then two columns. In the first column, I'd like you to put yourself. I'd like you to score yourself one to ten on which of these leadership styles you use most. 10 is the one, if you were to use one of these all the time, 10 would be it. Or maybe if you use one half the time, it's 50. But 10 being the one you most use, one being the one you least use, one to 10. Then in the next column, I'd like you to, to um, write experience. And the same way, marking 1 to 10, mark the leadership styles you experience at work. Not just from your line manager, try and take a, an overall snapshot of the leadership styles you experience most usually, most, uh, most of the time at work. Now you have both of those columns marked, just look at them. Where are their similarities and where may there be big differences? In some cultures, we find that there is a lot of commanding leadership, particularly where that organisation has been under pressure or where that organisation is experiencing change. In other organisations, we see that there is a lot of visionary leadership, but maybe there's not so much affiliative or democratic. So your snapshot tells you two things. It tells you the sort of leadership style you like to use, which is an indication of the leadership style you would like to receive. And it tells you the predominant leadership style within the culture of your organisation. When you can see that, you have a decision to make, a leadership decision. You can reinforce those positive leadership styles but I would ask you, as a true leader, what can you do to change any potentially negative leadership styles you perceive in your culture and move them towards the more positive? So the final exercise for this section is to take that. What can I do from my situation 
to make the leadership experience in my organisation more positive.